Good morning. Welcome to Bible study. This is, I believe, Bible Fellowship. We are in Houston, Texas, and we're a bunch of believers who love the Lord unashamedly and unreservedly. We study scriptures. The Bible says line upon line, precept upon precept. And we study scriptures here verse by verse because we believe no one buys a book and jumps about the chapters, the paragraphs, and the sentences in the book. But you read it from start to finish. That way you're able to understand the contents and possibly the mind of the author. And I know that since we've been doing that, we have sunk roots in God. And I do believe we're bearing fruit to the praise and glory of his name. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Um, we concluded the book of James last week, and we're about to start uh, Peter's epistle to the churches under his uh, purview. Uh, Bible scholars tell us it was written around AD 60, and uh, his theme even though he tells us that he's writing to the scattered believers uh, all over the then world, um, his theme is clear nonetheless, calling them to live in victory and to endure any kind of challenge or suffering a walking with the Lord might bring, which is quite apropos to the times that we're in right now. If you're sensitive in the spirit, you will know that the clock is winding down. Is coming is upon us. There's no other way to put it. Because of all the things that are going on, if you're uh, listening to current affairs, you know that there is no father that is going to stand by and watch his children be bullied or be harassed, or be made to live in what. No real father will do that. So we know that he will get us out of this place before all of that happens, and it's soon. Thank you, Holy Spirit. <clears throat> uh, my phone is supposed to be on Do Not Disturb, so give me one second. Thank you, Lord God. All right, this morning we begin with the book of uh, First Epistle of Peter to the scattered Christians all over the place. Chapter 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. An inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that faded not away, reserved in heaven for you. Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. But the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Whom having not seen, ye love, in whom, though now ye see him not, yet believe him, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. The end of your faith, even the salvation of your soul. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Wherefore, 
gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons, judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God, seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. Grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. Word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Praise God. Very long introduction. Peter lets us know who the author is, and he identifies himself as an apostle, which he was, one of the 12 apostles of the Lord. And he tells us who he's writing to. He calls them strangers because in the land where they sojourned, they were strangers. Not strangers from the truth, not strangers from the commonwealth of Israel, and certainly not strangers uh, from the church, but strangers in those places that they lived in, in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Bithynia is the old name for the kingdom of Ethiopia. I told you before, I said the land God originally gave to the children of Israel stretched from present-day Lebanon, present-day Ethiopia, all the way into... There are places in Nigeria today, in the Igbo land, that's the eastern, southeastern part of Nigeria, where they have found ancient artifacts, Jewish artifacts, which showed that they lived there. I have a map that shows that it stretched all the way into West Africa. That's how much land God gave them. But because Joshua did not appoint a successor, success without a successor is no success at all. You've got to empty yourself into someone. Otherwise, the work you are doing will die with you. Jesus left. 12 men or 11 men because Judas Iscariot messed up and someone else was appointed to take his place. You have to have a successor. Moses chose Joshua to be successor. And unfortunately, Joshua, Joshua did not follow suit and did not follow and did not uh, elect someone to take up the work where he left off. And so they never quite possessed all of the land that God gave to them. And today they are this tiny little strip of land of uh, the nation of Israel. But that notwithstanding, the covenant of the Lord with them still stands sure. Anyone who messes with Israel is with God. As a matter of fact, the Bible commands us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. It says, they shall prosper that love thee. People who love Jerusalem, God promises that they will prosper. Peace within their walls and plenteousness within their palaces. That's what the Bible says. So we should pray for Jerusalem. Peter tells them that they are elect. They're not here by accident. They're not here because someone invited you. Yes, someone did. But God ordained for you to be here. 
That's why you're here. Some of you are committed here because God ordained for you to be committed here. He says, I will build my church. I'm not the one building. You're not the one building. He is the one building. And he promises us that the gates of hell will never prevail against us. It doesn't matter what the enemy throws along our path. We're totally unmoved. Praise God forevermore. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. You were elected even before you were born. God said to Jeremiah in Jeremiah 1.5, he said, before you were formed in the belly, I knew you. Which means before your mom and your dad came together, you were already in existence because you are a spirit being. You are a spirit being. The Bible says in John 4, 24, God is spirit. I know your Bible says he's a spirit. God is not a spirit. God is spirit. That's, that's who he is. And he made us in his image and likeness, Genesis 1, 26 and 27. If God is spirit and he made you in his image and likeness, then you are spirit. But for you to be able to operate on planet Earth, he needed a body. So he got mom and dad together. They created a body. He put your spirit, which is an eternal being, doesn't die. He put it in the body they made, popped out a girl or a boy, XX or XY. There's nothing outside of that. The last I checked on the internet, they have 50 genders. That is sick. There are only two genders that God made. It doesn't matter what anyone feels. I identify as a monkey. Does that mean I'm a monkey? I identify as a man. Does that mean I'm a man? If you slice me up, you will find XX chromosomes, period. And if it was a guy, you slice him up, you will find XY chromosomes, period. If your dad gives a Y to your mom's X, you come out a boy. If your dad gives an X to your mom's X, you come out a girl, period. I don't care what studies are out there. I don't care what scientists are endorsing, whatever, because they are paid to do those studies. And if I'm paying you to do a study, it had better favor my stats because it's my money. <clears throat> it doesn't matter who's saying what. God has the final say. <clears throat> You were elect according to God's foreknowledge. He knew you. He made you. He made you for a purpose. Every manufacturer makes a product and it comes with a manual. Not only that, the product is made for a specific purpose. And until you go back to the manufacturer and go back to the manual that they wrote for the product, you will not find your identity. You will not know who you are. You'll go through life. You might achieve stuff, great education, good career, maybe invent stuff, doesn't matter. But you'll never really know who you are until you go to him who created you to find out what your purpose is. Right? You were elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. How? He sanctified you by the Spirit unto obedience. There was a time we were all running around the place doing whatever we wanted, however we wanted, whenever we wanted. It. And Jesus was just, yeah, somebody out there. But one day, something happened to you. And you decided, I can't go on like this anymore. I need God. And you fell on your knees. And you said what we call the sinner's prayer. And you became born again. That wasn't of your own doing. He had been pursuing you from the day you stepped on planet Earth. So you're not an accident. You're not a Christian because mom and dad were Christians. You're a Christian because you came to a realization 
at one point in time in your life that you needed a savior and you needed to be a follower of Christ, right? Through the sanctification of the spirit unto obedience and of course the blood that cleansed all of your sins and made you acceptable to a thrice holy God who cannot behold sin, who turned away from his own son the moment he took on your sin and my sin upon his spirit. He screamed on the cross, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God turned away from Jesus when he took on your sin and my sin. And if God turned away from his son at the point that he became sin and the sacrificial lamb, what makes you think he won't turn away from you if you continue in sin? Apostle Paul says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Don't please put scriptures up. God forbid. blood of Jesus Christ has paid the price once and for all for all sin, iniquity, and transgression. And as a child of God, you should eschew evil. It should not once be mentioned in the house of the Lord. And I bless God for what he's doing in the lives of those of us who are committed. Praise God. It says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his abundant mercy, begot us unto a lively hope. Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 that if Christ was not raised from the dead, we of all men would be most miserable. He had to give us hope. For three dark days, Jesus went to hell. For your sake and my sake. And with bated breath. All of creation waited. For his triumphant. Exit. From the bowels of the earth. So Jehovah's Witnesses. Who teach you. Or who teach their members. Not you. IBBF. I believe better things of you. Jehovah's Witnesses. Who teach that Jesus didn't go to hell. They have no clue what they're saying. Because if he did not go to hell. It means our sins was not paid for. And if your sins were not paid for, then you cannot go to heaven, which is why they teach that only 144,000 will go to heaven. If the rest of them will inherit the earth, because the Bible says the righteous shall inherit the earth. They are in complete error. And they have a huge machinery in Brooklyn, New York, where they print their books, print their Bibles, print their own literature, watch tower and all of that kind of stuff. And some of you, they come to your door, they knock on your door, you open your doors and you entertain them. You take the material from them, they're in your house. I suggest very strongly that you look for them and you remove them from your house. The doctrine is wrong. According to the Bible, not according to Pastor Mo. Jesus Christ said in John chapter 14, let not your heart be troubled, verse 1. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. And when I am done, I will come back and get you. That's what he said. So that where I am, you may be also. If he wasn't going to take us to heaven, he wouldn't say that in John 14. Praise God. He begot us again unto a lively hope by raising Jesus Christ from the dead. Because he lives, I know that should death close my eyes, I will open them on the other side of eternity. I know that without a shadow of doubt. He's not a man that he should lie. Cessation of life as we know it on earth is not cessation of my life. Because my life is hid in Christ with God. I cannot die. I'm a spirit being. And spirits don't die. It's the flesh that packs up 
because it has a timestamp on it. It's decaying daily, right? It begot us unto a lively hope by raising Jesus Christ from the dead. And that hope is the inheritance that is incorruptible. Incorruptible. That's why you cannot lend the members of your body to sin. Incorruptible, undefiled. Do not touch sin. Do not court sin. Do not participate in sin. Do not hang out with sinners. Love them. Pray for them. Minister to them. But don't go where they go. Don't do what they do. Don't see what they see. They will pull you down. It's easier. If I'm standing on the table and you're standing on the floor, it's easier for you to pull me off of the table than it is for me to pull you up onto the table. That inheritance does not fade. To the contrary, you should fan the flames of it minute by minute. minute. Jesus Christ said, the prince of this world cometh. He finds nothing in me. Please put that up. I think it's John 15 or thereabouts. Let it be said of you that the prince of this world comes and he cannot find anywhere to sink his hook. In your life, in your body, in your business dealings, in your finances, in your family life, let him not find a foothold. Because from a foothold, he will build a stronghold. Make no mistakes about that. It's a small sin that you're grappling with. You continue to entertain it. It's going to become a big boulder. All right? It doesn't fade. It is reserved for us in heaven. We are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. We are kept. It is in the past tense. But God can only keep the man that wants to be kept. That's why I love that song that says, Keeper, the one you kept has come to honor you. The one you kept has come to worship you. He can only keep you if you allow him to keep you. You keep going to where you're not supposed to go. God can't stop you. Almighty God, all powerful, cannot stop you for the simple reason that he gave you the power of choice, self-will. He might tug at you. He might minister. He might arrange circumstances and situations. Somebody to come and tell you. He might do all of that. But ultimately, he cannot stop you. It says you are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein you greatly rejoice, even though for a season, for now, you are in heaviness through manifold trials. That word temptations, there should be trials. It doesn't mean temptation. Uh, solicitation to do evil. He's talking about things that try us, things that buffet us, things that ruffle us, things that seek to destabilize us. We have been warned that these things will happen. So why do we then act like, oops, I didn't see that coming? He says there's no temptation that will seize you that is not common to man. Please put that up. But along with that temptation, there is a way of escape. So if you see a temptation or a trial or a difficulty, look beside it. It's right there. There is always a way of escape. And the first step is to go to him, Father, see, what do I do? He will speak to you. More than you want to be led, he wants to lead you. If you're a natural parent, you will understand what I'm saying. Your kids don't want you to tell them what to do. 
especially when they reach the stupid age of 18, stupid. Or society has lied to them, telling them when you're 18, you're an adult. You are a fool if you're 18 and you think you're an adult. A complete fool. 17 years, 364 days, you were fed, you were clothed, you were paid for. Everything you wanted was bought for you. Even when you started working, they didn't take your money from you. I hope they didn't. You still used your money how you wanted to use it because you were the one earning it. If you really, really, really want to be an adult when you turn 18, go and rent an apartment, buy a car, make the car payments. Or if you can put the cash together, buy cash. Buy your own groceries, buy your own clothes. Then we'll know that you're an adult. Don't call home. Don't call mom. Don't tell dad, send me something. Then we'll believe you're an adult. But because you know what? We that are the real adults, we don't get to call mom or call dad. The trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes. Because trials build character. There are some things you will never learn unless you go through the challenges. Please mute your mics. Please mute everybody. Who is the host? There are things you will never learn unless you go through difficulties. There are things God will allow in your life. Especially when he has been watching you for a while and you're playing the fool. Then he will allow one trial to come. The trial of your faith is more precious than gold which perishes. Though it be tried with fire. The trial of your faith will be found unto praise and honor and glory at the end of the day. Because it's in him you will find help. It's in him you will find sustenance. It's in him you will find the staying power. I've been through some situations where I have grown and said, God, when? Then I hear him say, I'm right there in the middle of it with you. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were cast into a burning, fiery furnace, heated seven times more than what it was before. He appeared in the fire with them. King Nebuchadnezzar screamed, didn't we put three men in the fire? He said, lo, I see four men loose, walking in the fire. And there is no hurt. Don't be squeamish when you have trials. Don't cry and complain. If you need to cry, cry, but then suck it in and buckle up. That's what you got to do. What would have happened if Jesus quit at Gethsemane? He showed us that he wanted to quit. He said to the father, Dad, do you have a plan B? I'm not feeling this passion that I'm supposed to go through. I'm not feeling it at all. Crucifixion? Death by as as asphyxiation? False trial? The buffetings, the slappings, the crown of thorn? The whipping, 39 stripes. Carried the cross, got to a point where he could not take one more step. Not one. The last time he slept was Wednesday night. Into Thursday. Because they were up all Thursday. They had the last supper, Thursday night. When they left the place where they had the last supper, they went to the garden of Gethsemane to pray. God sustained him. An angel came and ministered to him. They arrested him in the garden, took him to the Sanhedrin, 
began his trial, all night he was standing. Hadn't slept since Wednesday night. When they could not make head or tail of it in the morning, they dragged him to Pilate. Still on the trial. And then they put that wooden cross on him and told him to carry it to Golgotha, up a hill. When you say he died on the cross, you, you don't get a meaning. That is why I will die before I sin. I'm not talking about inadvertent things that we still grapple with because we're in the flesh. But for me to sit down and craft sin and think through it and execute it, it won't happen. It will not happen. Because I, I realize the worth and the weight as best as I can being human of what he did. No one has done that for me. Not even the mother that bore me. He says, whom having not seen, ye love. And that's applicable to us. We haven't seen him, but we love him. In whom, now ye, in whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice. We haven't seen him, yet we believe. And we rejoice. Mary, at the word of the angel, spoke the Magnificat, said, My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Does your spirit rejoice in God? It says he had looked upon the lowliness of his handmaiden. That from this time forth, all generations shall call me blessed. Because she realized the full import of what God did. Her election. And notice she pre-qualified herself by remaining a virgin. What are the things you qualify for that God can use you for? What are the things that you have set aside your life for? That if God was looking for someone through whom he could do A, B, C, or D, he can look and say, yeah, that one is mine. He'll do it. She'll do it. How is he using you? In what areas are you available to him to be used of him? Doesn't matter. You don't have to have a collar around your neck. It could be the secular job that you're at. Let that company know that because you are there, they are prospering. When they took the Ark of the Covenant into the house of obed for three months, he was blessed beyond measure. It was evident that the presence of God was in his household. And you carry you carry the presence of Almighty God everywhere you go. You show up, God shows up. You're a teacher. How are you bringing the anointing that is upon you to bear on that class? I'm not telling you to go and lay hands on the children. You'll get into trouble for that. But they can't stop you from praying. They can't stop you from speaking in tongues. You can't stop you from taking authority over a kid that's misbehaving in the class. Because you know we wrestle not against flesh and blood. On the job, they can't stop you from praying. They can't stop you from downloading wisdom from above to do what you need to do. So that in all things and at all times you excel. They've got to see the difference. Because that's what will attract them to Christ. The Christ that's in you. Going to work is not going to work as usual. Or living this life is not living the life as usual. The Bible says let men see 
your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Whom have you not seen ye love, in whom though now ye see him not, ye believe and yet rejoice with joy unspeakable, full of glory, unspeakable joy, indescribable joy, and it's a fruit of the Spirit. Child of God, learn the difference between joy and happiness. They are not the same. Happiness is an emotion. It emanates from your soul. Joy is a fruit of the spirit. It emanates from your spirit man. That's why in Nehemiah, I think it's 10.8 or 8.10, either of the two. It says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. That's why you have to protect your joy. Your joy is not predicated on anything that's going on in your life. That's why you cannot succumb to sadness and happiness one way or the other. You can be sad in your emotions, but be joyful in your spirit because you begin to speak the exact opposite of what you're feeling. You're not led by feelings. Romans 8, 1. 1 and 2, I believe. Therefore, there's now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. We don't walk after the flesh. We walk after the spirit. Whether I'm happy or not, I am joyful. Whether I'm sad or not, I am joyful. Because the joy of the Lord is what strengthens me. If Satan cannot steal my joy, he cannot steal my strength. And if I still have strength, it means I can put one foot after the other, regardless of what's going on. Knowing that he says he gives strength to the weary. He knows we will be weary. He knows we will go through these things. He's made provisions for us. But when you don't come to learn who you are, what you have, how to use it, you will be slapped up and down by world, by the world and the circumstances it throws at you. I've had the most challenging last four weeks. I keep showing up because I've told the devil, you haven't recruited that demon yet. The one that is capable of stopping Pastor Mo. You haven't discovered him. And you haven't assigned him to me. All the others are playing. I am so resolved. I am resolved. It says, joy unspeakable, full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. So it is by staying in a joyful state that I receive the end of my faith, what my faith is out there for. It is by remaining in a joyful state that I receive the end of my faith, even the salvation of my soul. My mind, my will, my emotions, my intellect, and my imagination. All five must continually be subject to the word. That's the battle ground. It's not my spirit. My spirit is created in his image and likeness. Brand spanking new. Completely sinless. My flesh is decaying. There's no good thing in the flesh. And so it's not dependable. Cannot depend on it. It can fail me any time. The battle is in my soul. What am I thinking in my mind? Because whatever you think on, you become it. As a man thinketh in his heart, so he becomes. What am I applying my will to? Is it to go and lie down under a Thick blanket 
and curl up with a bowl of ice cream and two big boxes of tissue? Is that where my will is inclined? Or my will is saying, get up. It's tough, but get up. Trust in God with all of your heart. He will deliver you. He never fails. He saw it coming. He allowed it. If he allowed it, there's grace available to bear it. Is that where you are channeling your will? Or you're channeling your will to just collapse and, and cry and get on the phone and call 53 people so that you can hear words of sympathy. Sympathy is ungodly. I've said that before and I'm saying it again. Sympathy will kill you. It's ungodly because it comes from your soul. Compassion. And it comes from God. How many times have you done something that was good? Showed kindness. But it was sympathy. And it didn't pay you. Someone lived in my house for four months. They don't give me one dime. Not a cup of water did they ever offer me to drink. When I went to complain to God, he told me, he said, it's sympathy. He must have been screaming. I didn't hear him. And I'm feeling the pitch. Compassion emanates from the spirit of God. That's what the Bible calls bowels. And even if you give your last dime out, out of a heart of compassion, God will stand in the gap until. But if you've done it out of sympathy, you are on your own. That's the truth. You receive the end of your faith, even the salvation of your soul, when you're joyful. When you're doing something and you lose your peace and you begin to complain and it's not pleasant anymore and you're being grated and irritated, there's no God in it anymore. Bible says, verse 10, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who promised of, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. They were prophesying about it, the Old Testament prophets. They were prophesying about the things you and I now are, is commonplace to us. We're walking in it. We're so privileged to be alive at this present time. They were searching, those prophets of old, what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ, which was in them, but they were wondering when that will, the spirit of Christ which was in them, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. They knew these things. The spirit of God in them showed it to them. Verse 12 says, unto whom it was revealed, that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them, that we have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost, sent down from heaven. They talked about it, but they never saw it. You and I are walking in it, and we're treating it, we're treating it with such frivolity. The Bible says even angels longed to look into it. Things that you and I, I don't want to say we take it for granted, but it's ours. We're in it. We're living in it. We're enjoying it. You say, my father, and he says, yes, my child. You say, Lord, this, that, and the other, and he moves. What a privilege. The God of heaven will pause to listen to little me kneeling by my bed. Stop everything he's doing just to listen to me. What an awesome privilege. 
angels long to look into it. Ephesians 3.20, I think it is. It says that, go on and quote it. The Holy Spirit. No, 3.10, not 20. Ephesians 3.10. To the intent that now on principalities and powers in the heavenly places might be known by the church, the manifold wisdom. When angels want to know about the manifold wisdom of God, they look to the church. The real church. I'm not talking about the organizations that are all over the place, because not every one of them is the church of the living God. When they, heavenly bodies, they desire to look into what you and I have. I'm pretty sure it was them that was asking God a question in Psalm 8. This is Pastor Mo, your Bible doesn't say so. Pretty sure it's them that is, they are saying to God, what is man that you're mindful of him? Or who would be asking God that question? You think God is asking himself that question? Somebody was asking, what is man that you're mindful of him? And the son of man that you, you pay him any mind. You even made him a little lower than yourself. You crowned him with glory and honor. You say whatever he binds, you bind. Whatever he loses, you lose. Guys, are you listening? He said, he that you have asked me nothing. Ask me. So that your joy can be full. Please put all those scriptures up. I know you are jumping for joy. Jump down. <laughs> can you imagine the great God of heaven. The possessor. Of everything that there is. The nameless one. The one who says I am that I am. Cut blanks. Fill the blank. Fill the blank. Lines in the chat. Whatever you need me to be, I am. Angels desire to look into. Peter says, on account of everything I've told you from verse 1 to verse 12, wherefore, Gird up your loins. Pull up your pants and tighten the belt. Gird up your loins, the loins of your mind, and be sober. Straighten up in your thinking. That's what it means by gird up the loins of your mind. Think right. Cast down every imagination that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. Bring into captivity every thought, every thought to the obedience of Christ. If you have the Holy Ghost on the inside of you, when an ungodly thought comes, you know. And you don't entertain it. You check it out immediately. I cannot stop birds from flying across my head, but I certainly can stop them from building a nest on my head. I cannot stop thoughts from coming, but I can stop them from staying in my heart. I crowd them out with the word. God has a word for every situation in your life. Every last one. Gird up your loin, the loins of your mind. Think right. Be sober. Take stuff out of the realm of the emotion. Bring it to the realm of your mind where you can think constructively. You can think rationally. And through your will that's submitted to God, make a decision, a godly decision. Use your will to drive that decision and harness the emotions. 
that can put you in trouble. And a hundred times out of a hundred times, you can dictate your outcomes. You can. That's how you were created to function. You were not created to be led by your emotions. They will put you in trouble. 100 times out of 100 times. You've been programmed from the day you were born to react emotionally. Ah, they pick you up. Your mom is an expert. She can even tell which cry is for what. If it's your diaper that's wet, she knows. If it's hunger, she knows. If you're hot or cold, she knows. And you grew up that way. Condition. Get what you want by being emotional. So wife, you manipulate your husband. I guess we made a mistake marrying you too. Since you are still a minor in your emotions. Let me show you a scripture. Let me digress. <laughs> I think I've shared it with you before. Let me bring another angle out for you to see. Genesis. God said in Genesis chapter 3, Verse 16, unto the woman, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. There will be an inclination in you, woman, to manipulate or control your husband with your emotions. That's what God said. But God has given him rulership, headship. It's the same language he used in chapter 4, verse 7, when he was talking to Cain about sin. So something happens and you start to cry, stop it. You said you were an adult. That's why we married the two of you. Something happens, you pout. For three days, you're not talking to him. The silent treatment. Stop it. If I was God, I would take your husband away for about a year. So that you know the worth of having a husband. The same thing goes for the husband. Because they too are sometimes manipulative. We need to be mature in our thinking. We need to be mature. By not paying attention to all those emotional, what's the word I'm looking for? Urges. Sit down, think about it, be rational about it, come to an adult decision and execute it. Back in Peter. Wherefore, get up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to your former loss in your ignorance. All the stuff you used to do in the past, the Bible says walk away from it. Or rather as he which, which hath called you is holy, be holy also in all manner of conversation. That word conversation means way of life. It's old English. It doesn't mean speech. Can God tell you to be holy if it's not possible to be holy? Can he require something of you that he has not equipped you to be able to do? Would that be just? But we know he's a just God. And so if he tells you to do something, the enabling power to do it would have been made available. If he says be holy, it means it is possible to be holy.
verse 15, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because as, as it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the founder who, without, who is without respect of persons, he judges according to every man's work. God does. He says, live here on earth in fear. Not terror, but reverential fear of the holy God that called you unto holiness. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain way of life that you received by tradition from your fathers, but you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Talking to the Jewish people, reminding them of the Old Testament. Who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world. And in the book of Revelation, the Bible tells us the same thing, that the lamb of God was slain before the foundations of the earth. Sometime in eternity past, the Godhead had gotten together and they had decided that son in the fullness of time, you will step out of eternity into time and you will go and redeem this people because from the attribute of foreknowledge, he knew that Adam would fall and that man would need a savior. So before he even created us, our salvation was settled. Verse 20, who verily was forwarding before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead, and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might not be in vain, but be in God. Seeing then that you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit, unto unpretentious love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Love is not a feeling. That's why marriages get into trouble. Love is a decision. And love is an act of your will. When you meet a guy and your, your heart is fluttering and, and you're blushing blue-black. Or blushing red if you are a white person. I, I give you two years, three years into the marriage. All that butterfly will fly away. When the wedding has finished and the marriage has started, because there's a difference between the wedding and the marriage. Yeah. It's not a feeling. It's a decision and it is fuel by an act of your will. If you look at the love that a parent has for a child, you will understand it because no matter what your child does, you can't stop loving them. You cannot. You can block them out of your life. You can decide I'm not talking to them again. They can't come to your house, this, that, and the other. But somewhere inside your heart, you cannot forget that child. I don't know about men, but women. Even the Bible says, can a mother forget the child she bore? And even if she does, even God said, if she does, yet will I remember you. Love each other fervently. It's a command. Jesus Christ said, a new commandment give I unto you, that ye love one another, even as I have loved you. So love ye one another. Satan cannot, absolutely cannot operate where there is love. Genuine love. Not pretentious, not lip service, not me saying something once your back is turned and I'm like, genuine love. And it can only come by praying one for another. It's impossible not to love someone you're praying for. Impossible. Once you begin to pray for that person and God gives you a spirit of intercession for them, 
you you will just love them. There's they go hand in hand, praying for people and loving them. You can't pray for someone you hate or someone you can't stand. What are you going to say before God? Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. The word of God, Hebrews 4.12, is alive. The Bible says it's alive and powerful. Old King, uh, King James says, quick. Quick is an old English word for people who are alive. The word of God is quick and active. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. It is able to cut between the spirit, the soul, and the marrow, which is in the body. And it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. All flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The, gra the grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. We're all going to die. That's why they say in the world, give me my flowers now, that I can smell it and appreciate it. Don't bring it to, to the funeral home. I don't need your flowers. What I'm seeing in heaven is more vivid and more real than whatever you went and bought in the florist shop. Give me my flowers now. I like that saying in the world. Someone is doing well, encourage them. Speak good to them. Love them. Motivate them. Exhort them. Come alongside them. You never know what time we all have. What if tonight is my time? Then you'll come and start crying. Oh, we never did. Pastor, what would Pastor say? That's the reason why you must love me, because you don't know. That's the reason why I love you, because I don't know. But you will feel the power of my love while we are on this side of planet Earth. Fervent love, one for another. That's what the church is about. It is but the word of Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. The word of God is the unchanging changer. It abideth forever. There's nothing the enemy can do about it. Questions? Thoughts? Rose? Pastor Mo, what you said about um, Genesis chapter 3, uh, 16, um, desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee. I had I was in a podcast. I was in a podcast last night, and it was and it was asking if your husband or the father of your children um, gets in trouble in a court. The judge asks you, "Is either you spend six months in jail, or he gets a life sentence?" And they asked the women, and a lot of women who were married and are baby mothers, they say they will not do it. Because if he got in trouble hearing that, they will let their man go for life sentence. And they will not trade six months for their husband. And that makes me realize that this generation just think about men as replaceable. You don't think about marriage as you, that person is going to be your forever. You know, like... Um, that's the mentality. Uh, that's the mentality of today. Every man cheats, um, you know. So, so, so when women think like that, is it's like that modern way of now. It's so difficult to. It is so difficult for many women to even believe. I stick to my tradition. I'm hoping that you know, just as you pray for the husbands to be in the house of worship. Well, well, I pray well, that I have well, my faith. We're going to get godly husbands in this fellowship. 
Yes, yes, because I, I believe that marriage is... godly men. They, they are around. And God is exactly. going to bring us to them. That, that's the truth. Exactly. We have to think of Mary. If you, you're desirous of getting married, start to work on yourself. Amen. Allow God to, to do what he needs to do in you. Adam was asleep when he was making Eve. And when he finished, he took Eve to him. Contrary to what we all believe growing up, that the man comes to find you. That scripture that says when a man finds a wife, he finds a good thing, is not talking about a physical search for a wife. It's talking about actually recognizing her when God brings her. That's what that scripture means, when a man finds a wife. Because many a man have left the one that was their wife. They didn't recognize her. I went to marry this floozy that showed them hell. It's in recognizing her that that scripture is saying when a man finds a wife. It's not in him searching. Adam was asleep. He wasn't searching. The statement he made is what tells me. He said, this is now the flesh of my flesh and the bone of my bones. That word now is significant, indicating that whatever God else had offered him was not it. Mr. Giraffe had Mrs. Giraffe. Mr. Hippo had Mrs. Hippo. Mr. Cockroach had Mrs. Cockroach. And all of them were passing in front of Adam. And he was looking at God like, God for real. And they could not find anything that was like him. So God said, all right, go to sleep, boy. I'm going to make you someone meat for you. And when God brought her, he recognized her. That's why he said, this is now the flesh of my flesh and the bone of my bones. So many a man have married the wrong woman, not recognizing the flesh of the flesh and the bone of the bone when God brought her. Either because she was short or she was dark skinned or she was this or she didn't have the behind, or she didn't have the boob, because that's what they were looking for. They were not looking for character. They were not looking for depth. They were not looking for somebody who can run the race, longevity. I need to start my marriage seminars again. Please, please, first of all, because you know, <laughs> you know what? We, we, we need to hear it, and I'm hoping that the men they are here you know, instead of going from dating to dating, you know, they say, how many men do you see in this fellowship? Okay, but even, <laughs> let me not discount Andre and so many others, I don't know they're here, but um, with, with love, I'm just saying, because they're jumping from one woman to another and they it's just because causing the women, them trauma. Because the women are foolish. Exactly. If we all, women, if we all decide uh, our legs are closed, they will marry. But they approach him foolish women past them all. That's what it's... I said. If all women can come to that place, they will have no choice but to marry. But if I'm living right and I don't want to compromise and he's looking at me, what's wrong with you? There are 53 out there that I can go to. So it behoves Almighty God to look into the heart of every woman who wants a godly husband to take her to him. But while you're waiting, you fix yourself. Amen to that, Pastor Mo. Amen. Can't Amen. wait for that counseling. <laughs> Cynthia? Good morning, Pastor Mo. Good morning, family. I wanted to piggyback on what um, was just said about people getting divorced and just not staying together, um, a problem come up and they're, you know, I'm out of here. I have seen this over the years get progressive and progressive within the church to where I believe the statistic is the church has about 50% divorce rate, almost equal with the world. But one of the things that I think we should teach more in the church is the importance of honoring your vow, your commitment, your promise. Because people will promise things and go on off and, and just act like, uh, you know, there's nothing to it. But I don't really think the body of Christ really understands. And there hasn't been a lot of teaching on 
making a vow and how important it is to your life because God says to um, in Malachi, that's the only place where he says to prove me, prove him. He says, when you make a vow, he says, you better perform it or it's counted unto sin to you. So I would like to, you know, at some point have more teaching on that. Love you. Thank you. Bless you. Truth be told, <laughs> the stuff that's been taught in churches is designed, it's not designed to build character. That's the truth. I'm yet to find one minister who consistently teaches on character, Christian character, Christian virtues. It's about how to overcome, how to succeed, how to prosper. It's about, it's about, it's about how to grow their own ministry and grow their church membership. That's why I know that IBB, FIBBC will grow. Because the foundation is important to a building. The higher you want the building to go, the deeper you must dig the foundation. Christian character and virtues. Youth ministry should begin to teach about finances. Should begin to teach about these godly characters that you will that you will need to be able to succeed in, in a marriage. Why you don't prep young people? When mom has four children by four men, what are you going to say to your son or your daughter? There's a proverb in my language. I'm carrying a basket and the basket is wonky on my head. And you're looking at the basket and you're saying the basket is, is bent. Meanwhile, I'm not knees. You know what it is when you say someone is not knees? Do you know what that is? I don't know if it's something that's, that you're familiar with in the US. They sometimes call it K-leg. If I have K-leg and, my, and my, my gait is tilted, obviously what I'm carrying on my head will be tilted. So the problem is not what I'm carrying on my head. The problem is, is my gait, G-A-I-T, gait. The problem with marriages and homes is from the foundation. The things we're seeing are proof of faulty foundations. And in John chapter 4, and I know I'm digressing, in John chapter 4, Jesus Christ purposely went to Samaria, a place that Jews don't go to. He purposely went to Samaria to purposely meet the woman of Samaria to purposely change her foundation. She was an evangelist. But no one knew. She was a sinner. She had been with five men. The sixth one she was with, she was still shacking up with him. But Jesus detoured and went to a place that Jews don't go to. Went to a particular well because he knew this woman would come to that particular well. And he engaged her in a conversation. Give me some water. I have a teaching on it. Jay, if you can, please post it so that they can go and listen to it. The man said, why are you asking me for water? What, what do I have to do with you? Jews and Samaritans don't mix. Then from give me water and the well, whether it's deep, whether it's Jacob's well or whatever, they went to go and call your husband. And she said, I don't have any husband. She just said, you are well said. The five you had before, you were not married to them. The one you're currently with, you're shocking with. Word of wisdom and word of knowledge operating in Jesus' life. 
the gifts must be operating in your life. That's what's going to stop the unbeliever dead in their tracks. And they'll pay attention to you. Because when he said that to her, she calmed down. Or her, why are you asking me for what her? Samaritans have nothing to do with Jews. Da, 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 da. She calmed down. She said, I, I perceive you're a prophet. Go and read John chapter 4. When he had finished with her, the Bible says the woman left her water pots. Very significant. She left her water pots. Water pots are made of clay. She left everything fleshly. She ran into the village and began her ministry. Come and see a man that has told me all things that I ever did. And for her sake, the whole village came to a saving knowledge of Jesus. He stayed two extra days teaching. He detoured to release her into her call as an evangelist. And then years after, the Bible says that of Philip, great was the gain of Philip in Samaria because a woman had broken the fallow ground and had entertained Jesus. And the city entertained Jesus. So when Philip got there, spreading the gospel was a piece of cake. We need to start to educate our children. You have mixed sexes in the home. Teach your son to begin to honor you and honor your daughter. You're 16 year old. You're still doing his laundry. What's wrong with you? He has no chore in the house. He's constantly in his room. He's not playing one game. He's on social media. You cook and you call him, come and eat. He'll eat, he will not wash dishes. You will go to the kitchen and wash dishes. And you're raising somebody's husband. It's God forever. Um, Tisha. Hi, Pastor May. How are you? I'm well, thank you. God bless you. Good, Good thanks. Um, I just um had a question about um, you know, when you just brought up Genesis, it just brought something to my head about relationships because I feel like I'm getting a bit of pressure from my family right now. I'm like first generation in the UK and my family's from Africa. My... I mean, with all of my cousins, they just basically want us to all get married right now. So um, <laughs> basically, I've been doing a deep dive into uh, relationships in the Bible, and I just started to read over some verses that talk about um, being a wife. And the thing is, I don't know if it's like what's in me or what, what it is, but for some of the stuff I was reading, I couldn't help but feel like there was quite a mean tone <laughs> when certain things were said when he was speaking to like women or wives in general. But um, I know it's not... It's, I don't know how to explain it, but I just felt like a bit of it was said quite meanly, <laughs> if I'm being honest. But I just wanted to know what and um, how you think I can better understand what the Bible actually says about being a wife and a woman without feeling like it comes across sort of mean. And also um how um like no, yeah, that's basically my question. Because one thing I used to like first when I first went through all the verses, I was literally asking God, like, how could you put me here? Say I have dominion, but then all of that needs to be submitted, or someone else could have authority over whatever like I have. <laughs> and I was really a bit confused. I know that's not the case. I just want to understand it more, if you know what I mean. First of all, do you believe yeah. that God loves you? Yeah. If you believe that He loves you, then His commandments are not grievous. Mm -hmm. that's the first thing I'm going to tell you and you have to understand that language back then is not language now mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with calling you to walk in submission to your husband are you not submitted to your boss on the job <laughs> yeah, of course. and you said you're from Africa I'm not sure which country I'm from Africa. Zambia yeah from Africa, okay I'm from Africa. Were you not subject to your dad? Yeah. Would you look at him? Could you speak to him? Could you? Could you? You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. 
the way we were raised is different from the way the Western world raised their children. Mm -hmm. If you can submit to your dad and submit to a boss, why can't you submit to a husband? Mm -hmm. Every institution, organization, whatever you want to call it, has to have one head. Anything with two heads is a freak. We are going down the street and a two-headed man is walking in, in your direction. What are you going to do? What will you do? A two-headed <laughs> man is walking towards you. He's going to let you run away. <laughs> You're going to turn around and run away. <laughs> so there has yeah. to be a headship. Headship is vested in the man. A man that does not understand God and why headship is vested in him, abuses it. And that's no reason why I should be bent out of shape because men don't understand headship. That's a broad and sweeping statement, but I made it for the sake of this conversation. There are men who understand headship and who understand the power of delegation, who recognize that this woman is a gift from God in my life. There are some things lacking in me that she brings to compliment me. When a man is secure in himself and secure in his God, the gift of his wife, the ability of his wife, the brilliance of his wife, the know-how of his wife doesn't in intimidate him. If you have asked God for your husband and he has asked God for his wife and God has brought them together, they will understand that, listen, I had a challenge when I was married. My husband walked out of our marriage in 2011. I had a challenge because I said to God, why didn't you pair, why don't you pair people who are alike so that there won't be problems? God laughed and he said, no, there will be problems. He said, I pair people who are not alike so that your strength will complement his weakness, his strength will complement your weakness. The two of you working together have no weaknesses. It's all strength. That's the wisdom of God. But when a man doesn't understand that, and your wife is the, is the, is the, is the center of attention, your wife is, she walks into a room, everybody notices her, she can sing, she can dance, she can play the guitar, she can do this, she can do that, and the other and you begin to feel small and insecure, you're in trouble. So because people don't fully understand what it is that God has done with marriage and they are operating in it in a sick way, all right? That doesn't mean marriage is not good or marriage doesn't work. Why would I want to submit to a man who loves me, who takes care of me, who thinks about me, who's mindful of my needs. I would not want to submit to him. Truth be told, you're joint heirs. That's what the Bible says. And if a man understands that, then he understands that you're an equal. You're not inferior. Your spirit man is exactly like his own. You just live inside bodies that are different for the purpose of the creator. I had to come as a woman so I could birth Ariane, David, and Valerie. That was one of my purpose. those three into this world. I could not have come as a man. So when he made my dad give my mom an ex, he knew what he was doing, that Mo was coming. And Mo was going to sit here to teach. Mo was going to have those three children. Mo was going to do A, B, C, and D. He knew the purpose for which he created me. So he created me female. And he knew that he would call the female to walk in submission. So I have no problem walking in submission. But if you marry me and you are intimidated by the gifts and the talents that God has given me, how can I help you? How? It's not my fault that I am who I am.
So I can submit to any man, any man that is my husband. I can. And listen to me. Men will bear me witness, the grown men that are here. The more you submit, the more control you have. You hear me? The more you submit, the more quote unquote control you have. His heart will so trust in you. Proverbs 31. He will not breathe without asking you, honey, should I breathe? But when you're constantly resisting him and constantly second guessing him and constantly this, that, and the other, he resists because he knows headship is vested in him. And you're not according that respect that's due him to him. That's why your house is boiling. Somebody tells him something and say, I'll talk to Tisha. I'll get back to you. Because he knows Tisha's heart towards him. That's God's wisdom. And if you do it God's way, you will get God's results. The thing to do is to marry a godly man. Don't be fooled by looks. Don't be fooled by height. Don't be fooled by, by skin, complexion. Don't be fooled by, by the money he has on the family. Don't be fooled by like that. Look for Christ-like character in him. And you be sensitive to the spirit of God because people know how to pretend. Until you get into it, then you see, ah, what you never saw, even if you dated him for two years, be led of the spirit of God. There's no pressure in getting married. I understand what you mean. African parents go to university, get a good job, marry and give us grandchildren. That's all they know. But don't let anybody push you into what you're not ready for. Thank you. You're welcome. Chi Chi. Unmute yourself. So Pastor Mo, good morning, family. Good morning, Pastor Mo. So um, it was kind of to say what you already, I, want, I raised my hand before you started going and I knew you were going to just say it. But um, when, when you did read, um, like cer there's certain verses in there, I used to feel kind of like the same way. And I guess what I felt was, maybe I had too much pride at that moment. You know, when you start off weak and then you find some type of worldly strength, which is not godly strength, that means you learn it in the wrong way. So now you feel like, okay, it seems like my excuse was, oh, a man wrote this Bible. <laughs> a man wrote this Bible. It's all only favoring the man. But then when you, I started like, you know, counseling with you, attending the Bible service, I realized The more I fixed me, I didn't find it as an attack anymore, is what I'm going to say. Because naturally, if I had it my way, which is God's way, I would love to be at ease and let someone take the lead that I trust. You know what I'm saying? So I guess what it was, there was so much brokenness in me and naiveness and me not holding myself accountable. I had to address the anger. Once I addressed the anger, I was able to read with a calming heart. So now I guess people be looking at me like, girl, are you okay? You drunk? I'm like, no, I'm just, I'm chill. I'm happy because I understand more. Mm -hmm. And like you said, the more divine, I really realize it makes people really like, when you start in an argument and you're like, okay, I get it. You know, my, my apologies. I didn't mean to cut you off. The person pauses and is like, wow, let me calm down. Cause I'm always trying to win a conversation I realized it's because maybe I felt like I wasn't worthy or I felt like I had something to prove. So I started reading certain verses that you suggested to me and it made so much sense. It made so much sense. So that was just to what she was saying. So my question now to you, I raised my hand. How do you know when God's presence is there? Like, you know, you, you do what you, you do, the best like you you do your best not to sin especially definitely not intentionally 
you fast, you seek unto God. So how can you identify when the spirit is present? Yeah, there's some feelings, but sometimes I want to be accurate because sometimes I'm kind of in my own spiritual high that is just because I'm excited, if that's making sense. So how can I, besides dreams, how can I realize when God's presence is present? First of all, God's presence is always with you, 24-7, 365. Okay. okay. He never leaves you. Second of all, the word. God will never do anything outside of the word. Okay. That's why in this fellowship, I emphasize knowing the word. Because knowing the word is knowing Jesus. Jesus is the word. And if you know the word, Whatever circumstances come your way, there will be an inward witness with the word. All right. All right. So I meet this guy and all my check boxes are ticked. I'm still going to remain sensitive in the spirit. So show me what I need to know. Right. Let me see what I need to see. You said this is a lifetime commitment, and I'm ready to make the commitment with John Do. But Lord, I do realize that as a human, I'm limited. So I'm depending on you to show me what you need to show me. And when a man loves you, when a man genuinely loves you, sex is the furthest thing from his mind. That's the truth. He wants it. Don't get me wrong. But is he after your well-being? Is he after your spiritual well-being? Does he lead in the place of prayer? Has he shown spiritual maturity? Because that's what's going to carry you through the test of time. Okay. Yeah. Next, is he your friend? Can you laugh together? Can you laugh at one another? Does he laugh at himself? And understanding disagreement, it's in my book. I recommend that book on marriage. Disagreement in marriage is healthy. Contrary to what we are told, please. Disagreement in marriage is right. It is healthy and it should happen. Because both of you are not robots. She said both of us are robots. In the Bible. Abraham told Sarah when they got to Egypt, let's lie and say you're my sister because you're beautiful. They'll take you away from me. That was his reasoning. They lied. Pharaoh saw her. His minister saw her and told Pharaoh, have you seen Abraham's sister? She is a 12 over 10. Pharaoh hey. probably sent for her. But if he would have showed up to say, this is my wife, Pharaoh probably wouldn't have done so. He was afraid they would kill him and take her. Mm -hmm. She should have disagreed. My Lord, I thought you said God said we should leave father, leave mother, leave kindred, and go to a place that he was going to show you. Egypt is not the place. God said, take your wife and go. Although he brought Lot along because Lot's father had died. That was his nephew. My dear, God said, we're going to a place you're going to show us. It's not Egypt. No one is going to take me from you. She should have disagreed. She didn't. Job and Mrs. Job. Look at you. I know my Redeemer liveth. And you're full of boils. You can't sit down. You can't lie down. You can't eat. All our children are dead. All the family business is gone. You're still telling me I know my Redeemer lives. He disagreed with her. Even if he saves me, yet will I praise him. He disagreed with her. Ananias and Sapphira. Listen, I don't know who suggested it, whether it was Ananias or Sapphira, one of them. <laughs> but Ananias suggested it. Listen, we, we, we sold the land for $100, but we're not giving $100 in church. Let's give $60. let us give $40, whatever. They agreed. Got to church. Peter said, so how much did you guys sell the land for? Ah, it's $60. He 
Peter said, why have you lied to the Holy Ghost? When the land was in your possession, was it not yours? After you sold it and you got the money, was the money not in your, pos in your possession? Why are you lying? God judged him with death. One of them should have disagreed. If it was Ananias, Sapphira should, should have said, sweetheart, no. Let's just tell him we sold it for $100, but the family needs 40 or the family needs 60 all we can give is, is 40 or 60 as the case may be. You think Peter will say, you are mad, go and bring all the money. Right. That's what Peter would have said. And if it was Sapphira who suggested it, and then I should have said, no, my dear, no. Let's tell Peter, this is what we have. This is what we want to give. Disagreement in marriage is healthy. You can disagree without being disagreeable. You can disagree without being nasty. You can disagree without being rude. It's blue, it's green, it's blue, it's green, it's blue. All right, honey, I think it's green, but if you want to do blue, let's do blue. Problem solved. If it's time sensitive and a decision must be made, then why you submit? Because he's the head. And if he's wrong, the God who made him the head will catch him. Because he realizes that his decision can affect the entire family, wife and children. <laughs> wife, if you're wise, you will come away from hey, submission. Hey, I, I don't want to submit. We're equal. You will come away from that nonsense to a place of agreement. If any two shall agree, it will be done. That's wisdom. Come away from that nonsense. So even if it's wrong, because you have come into agreement, the power of agreement will kick in. And your home remains peaceful, loving. And, and, and you're just enjoying each other. Chasing around sure. in the bedroom, in the nude, with pillow fighting and whatever else we do for kids. Pillow fighting. That's the more you funny, okay? <laughs> Been there. Done that, worn the t-shirt. I told you, the man that marries me now, if it's in the books for me, he will go to heaven before he goes to heaven. Amen. <laughs> oh, girl. Seriously. Oh, because I look back at 36 years of marriage before he threw the towel in. I wasn't going anywhere, problems and all. Because right. I'm, I'm dogged like that. Once I commit, I commit. Everything we fought about is stupid. Right. Like that. But you see, when you're in it, you don't see it. Mm -hmm. So while you're waiting, there's power in waiting. There's latent power in waiting. That's what you should be doing, empowering yourself to be that wife that he can't breathe unless he asks you. Lintia. Oof. Thanks, Pastor Mo. As you were as you were speaking, Pastor Mo, the um the story of Abigail and Nabal came to mind, and how Nabal was such a hard man, disrespected David when he came, he and his men came to their land just to they wanted to refresh their animals, and Nabal, um, being the the bad character that he was, he disrespected David, and so um when the word came to Abigail. Abigail used her wisdom and gathered her handmaids and everything and took food out and refreshed the animals and all. And she, and she saved their household. When they, when uh, Nathan heard about it, I believe he had a heart attack and died. And then Abigail ends up being, becoming the wife of David. So even if the husband, as you were saying, is, is, uh, doesn't have the right character or whatever, God will still look out for the wife and the, and the family because David could have wiped them out completely on the face of the earth if he had a presence of mind to. So that's what I wanted to say. Amen. When we get to the New Testament, you'll, you'll come across that story and you'll understand. Deshaun, can you put your camera on so we can see you? My, aim, my camera angle is kind of funny, but... There's my picture. Like it's I, my camera's at the bottom of my, of my uh, computer, so you won't be able to see me. Um, but 
This is my first time in amazing teachings, but I do have a question. Um, I'm in my word constantly, but my issue is when I pray, when I try to connect with God, you know, we have different ways of receiving the message from the Lord, you know, so I want to know from you, how do you know, how do you hear, know when to move or know where to stay still? The word. God's not going to lead outside of the word. I have so much word stored on the inside of me. I don't even know what I don't know. And so at every point in time, me personally, the spirit of God has a word that he will quicken. I've been studying the Bible upwards of 40 years. Okay. So it's it's the word. The leading comes from the word. Okay. Uh, who is 5-N-N-A-D-G? It's Gradivy. I didn't sign in. Pastor, how are you doing? Is that Gravity? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, hello, how are you doing? I'm well, thank God. Um, I kind of wanted to, um, uh, cause Chichi said something and I just wanted to share, to share an experience that I can kind of illuminate an answer for her. She said she had asked, how do you know whenever I'm with somebody or whatever, um, if the God's there, basically like how do we move forward if we're talk in the talking stage or how do I trust that this is what God is basically this is what god wants is that, is it, that that was kind of what i got from her question and um i just i, I want to admit this so that way it can illuminate for anybody who's you know in a relationship with a guy because i kind of i've kind of been doing some self-reflect reflection and i found that um whenever you're in a relationship as from a woman's perspective whenever you want whenever you want to know I guess where the relationship is going, or if this is a godly man, or, or if I should choose this, if this is what God wants, it has to be determined on is this man really submitting to God? Meaning that is he under the authority of God, and and you 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 um, it's not like a feeling. You'll see that you'll see it by his action. You'll see it by the way he acts and how how he goes about certain things, especially even sex. You know, because sex, like you said, it's something that we want, but that's the last thing. So if if a man is is easily falling, falling to sin while you're with him, that means he's not truly submitting to the word of God like he thinks he is. If that if, if that makes sense. And that's something that happened. That happened to me. That happened to me. And um I had to do a self-analysis that I wasn't completely submitted to the word of God or really really um you know under the authority of God because if I was it wouldn't have been something that would that could have easily overtaken the relationship if that makes any sense. I don't know if you're following or if I'm blabbing around. I understand what you're saying. Truth be yeah. told, I'm going to redirect you to the word. Okay. All right. Joseph had not touched Mary. When Mary came and said, I'm going to be pregnant, or I am pregnant, and just said, well, not mm -mm. And he was minded to put her away. And then God came and said, no, don't. The child she's carrying is from me, etc., etc." And then Joseph was instructed not to touch her for nine months. You marry a wife. You that you cannot wait for the wedding night. Then God says for nine months, don't touch her. And then after a woman delivers a child, it takes a while for all of that area to heal, for sex to start. So we're looking at possibly 10, 11 months. <laughs> God will never ask you to do what he has not empowered you to do. And if you are, if you if you love a woman, and that's the woman you're looking to spend the rest of your life with, sex is the last thing to be talking about. It beclouds your judgment. I don't know why young people can't see this. Once you bring sex into the equation, it's over. I promise you. 
And that's why you slept with 53 women. Sex skews the relationship. You can't determine character. You can't determine maturity. You can't determine depth. You cannot determine longevity. These are things you need for a marriage to work because you will fight. All right. Um, lost my train of thought, but basically you need to be looking for the things that you need to make the relationship last. It's a lifetime thing. I once heard Warren Buffett say this. I was talking to a group of uh, young college kids. If I bought you one car and I said to you, this is the only car you will have for the rest of your life, how would you treat that car? Same thing. It's because you think your wife is disposable or your husband is disposable and you can pick up another one. That's the reason why you do what you do. That's the reason why you have no longevity. That's the reason why you have no tolerance. That's the reason why you don't want to work through anything. 90 out of divorces, out of 100 divorces, we're not happy again. What has that got to do with anything? What has happiness got to do with assignment? Especially where the lives of children are involved. What has your happiness got to do with anything? Immaturity. Period. End of story. Character. Like I said earlier on, if Jesus quit at the Garden of Gethsemane, where would you be? Kathy? Good morning, Pastor Mo. Good morning, everybody. So I just wanted to um, to uh, make a uh, say something about two things that you shared th today. The first thing, um, when you talked about, you know, when we're 17 and then 365 days later, we're, we're 18 and we're adults. So I graduated from high school when I was 16 and I had to wait a whole another year to to march with my class. And so I remember when I was in the waiting period. Um, I used to tell my mom, I'm grown now, I'm grown, I can do what I want, you know, because I'm, I, you know, I'm an adult. And so at 17, you know, she told me, okay, you want to be an adult, then you have to move, you have to move out. And so I moved to a whole nother city and, um, and, and thought and had my own apartment, had, got a job. And I wasn't even a year after I, I left home that I was, I had already met my now ex-husband and um, just was so excited about being married. I didn't even know when I think about it, I didn't even know what life was supposed to look like because I did it all so fast. And because I didn't wanna listen to my mom and her guidance and I thought I knew everything because I was 17, I was grown. So by the time I was 18, I was already talking about marriage and having children. And so when I think about it now, and when, sometimes when I talk to young people, I, I tell them that 17 is like, you don't know anything at 17. Like I didn't even know anything at 18 or 19. At 19, I was already married with, with children. You know, um, my ex-husband was uh, in the military. So I was so proud. I thought I had a military man. You know, back then there was like, oh, you know, you got somebody in the military, you're going to be set for life. But because I didn't know who I was, you know, I stayed married for 38 years. Um, and you know the story, you know, my, my marriage was an abusive marriage. And so, but I, when we talk about the part about submission, for me, I thought submission was, even though he was 
beating me up and, and saying all kinds of things to me that my job was to stay, that that was me being submissive, that my husband was still in charge of me and he could do anything he wanted to do, but because I was supposed to be submissive, that's what that meant for me. And so now that um, we, you, you, sh you go over the, you know, you, you teach the word the way you do. Now I know that, you know, like a light bulb, you know, I guess I could say went off in my head because I was, I was thinking to myself, my goodness, if I would have known um, the word, the way that I, I'm learning it now, my choices would have been so different. Because mm -hmm. at 17, 18, 19, I didn't know a thing. Even at 20, you know, we lived in Germany when I, when, at, when I was 20. I didn't know anything. I didn't know the language. You know, it was just me and him. So I didn't really know anybody. So I had to learn, like, going through the marriage, like, learn things on my own. And so um, those two things just resonated with me. Like, you know, if my kids could have stayed with me until they, you know, were older, I wouldn't mind because I know at that age, I didn't know a thing. And by me not knowing my self-worth and how a wife is supposed to be treated, um, I just, I think that I just, um, how do you say, it became a custom to me. Like it was a custom that, okay, if, if, if I cooked dinner and he didn't like it, I knew that that was going to be a fight that he was going to do something to me if I didn't cook the right dinner. So it became normal. I normalized abuse. But learning the word, the way that I'm learning it now, it's like, wow, like, it's so plain. And it's so simple that this is, this is what, this is what love is not somebody doing all these bad things, because I thought that's what love was. I'm going to be honest. I thought that love was like, Oh, he loves me. He cares about me. That's why he's doing all these things. But there's no way that that's what love is, you know. And so now, I just don't feel so good about it. Two things. Let's let's look at submission. Mm -hmm. The etymology of the word submission can be divided into two independent words: sub and mission. Okay. The dictionary definition is sub is under. Mm -hmm. Mission is a task. Mm -hmm. that's all God is asking you to do come under the mission mm -hmm. come under the task that I have assigned to this person mm -hmm. that's what submission is mm -hmm. submission is not subserviency submission is not inferiority as a matter of fact if you were to take uh, an IQ te test maybe you are, you are that much more intelligent than him mm -hmm. it's not impossible to have a wife that's more intelligent than the husband mm -hmm more talented, more gifted, it's not impossible, okay? It has nothing to do with what's up here. Mm -hmm. It has to do with order in the whole. Mm -hmm. So in act of fact, Ephesians chapter five, verse 21, mm -hmm. it says, submit yourselves one to another. That's what the Bible says. But because typically the church is pastored by men, they don't refer to that verse 21. Mm -hmm. Submit yourself one to another. So I have a task. It is to preach the word. The man that marries me must leave room for me to preach the word of God and not hinder me. You cannot say because you're my head. I've planted, I believe, Bible church. If you want to marry me now, you will marry me with, I believe, Bible church. You're not going to tell me to quit pastoring that church because you want to marry me. You're not the man for me. Because the God who told me to start it is not schizoid. Mm -hmm. If he told me to start a church and pastor it, he's going to tell you that. So you have to come under that mission that I've assigned to your wife. Mm -hmm. And give her wings to fly. Support her. Encourage her. Cry with her. Laugh with her. Provide finances. If he is called to something, and God is not going to call him to something that is at variance with what he has called me to. I come under that mission and I give him all the support he needs to excel in what God has called him to do. That's how you submit one to another. All right. And then scientifically speaking, biologically speaking, 
The switch to adult thinking doesn't happen until you're 25. Mm -hmm. Go and research it. Mm -hmm. If you're under 25, you're still stupid. You do not have wisdom. Mm -hmm. That switch from childhood, teenage years into adulthood actually happens around the age of 25. This is what science tells us. So one young man that used to be in this fellowship, he's gone off now. And when I say gone off, he's gone off. Came to me, 19. I've found her. I'm like, you found her. Did you lose someone? Because it was with tears. No, 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 I found my wife. I froze, 19. You found your wife? And who might that be? Oh, you haven't met her past them all? Okay, what's her name? Told me the name. Uh, Y'all live in the same city? Oh yeah. How old is she? She's 23. <laughs> <laughs> I promise you, I didn't laugh. I did not laugh. <laughs> I think this is the first time I'm laughing. You're 19, she's 23. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I told him straight out, you know your pastor. I said, that's not your wife. If y'all would have met at, at 36 and 31, 32, maybe. Mm -hmm. But not at 23 and 19. She doesn't know her mind. You most definitely don't have a mind. Because if you had a mind, you would know that a 23-year-old woman is not the woman for you at 19. There's so many things that go into that decision. That's why when we marry you, we tell you that marriage is an estate that you don't enter into unadvisedly. Mm -hmm. You think about it because it's a lifetime commitment. But because people don't see it as a lifetime commitment, if it's good, I stay. If it's horrible, I'm gone. That's the attitude. And it's 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 one of the biggest blows that the devil has dealt the church. Because as long as that we don't have the unit, the smallest unit of society, which is the family, as long as we don't have that, we don't have the church. Mm -hmm. Count how many men are here. Count how many women are here. Because men don't even recognize that their first responsibility is to God mm -hmm. and that they must seek him in any and every way possible. Go to a Christian bookstore and I'm going to stop with that because I have to run. Go to a Christian bookstore and just, well, we don't have bookstores anymore. So many things have changed. But back in the day, if you stood in a Christian bookstore and watched, women will come in and go to books on marriage, books on the home, books on, on family, on raising children. The men will come in and go to books on business, books on the anointing, books on releasing the power, books on the seven prophecies of. They don't work at their marriage. They don't study concerning marriage. They don't study the wife they've married. They don't think about how to direct her life in a way that's going to bring glory to God because she's your responsibility before God. You think once you can rent an apartment and put her inside or buy a house and put her inside and buy her a car, whatever, you're done. Just start having babies for me. Her spiritual well-being is squarely on your shoulders. Her mental well-being is on your shoulders. Her physical well-being is on your shoulders. That's the greatest investment of your life. Because that is where you're going to deposit your posterity, your seed. That's going to bring forth children that will carry your name. But they don't think like that anymore. She's, she has long blonde hair or she has long braids or her complexion. She's foxy. 
That's what you're looking for. Foxy. There'll be many foxes in your house. Not so. The relationship between a man and his wife is exactly the same as Jesus Christ and the church. You want to husband your wife? Study Jesus and the way he husbands the church. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 to the end. God around, love you all so much. Father, we thank you. The entrance of your word brings light, understanding, and illumination. Give you glory, honor, and praise. So much has been said today. Thank you for First Peter. We could only do chapter one, but you spoke on equivocally to our hearts, and we have heard you, Lord. Thank you. Continue to write your laws upon the tablets of our hearts. The Bible says it is you that works in us. It's not of him that willeth or of him that runneth, but you, O oh God, who works out your pleasure, your good pleasure in us. Let our lives continue to reflect your light, your life, and your glory. We pray with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you all. Maybe we'll do a, a, a marriage seminar soon. It's just that, guys, I 